Welcome, everyone, to Shadow of Truth, and today is Monday, March the 6th, 2015, and your hosts are Dave Kranzler from InvestmentResearchDynamics.com and Rory Hall from TheDailyCoin.org, and our special guest today is the silver guru himself, Mr. David Morgan. I wanted, I know everyone has, has seen the employment numbers, or probably has seen them, and I just wanted to, um, it's a source of irritation for me because on Friday the stock market was closed, but the futures were still open when the employment report, when the employment report was released on Friday, and um, the number came in at 126,000, that's the headline number that every, everyone seems to care about, even though none of the numbers are, are, are credible, but um, it was 50% below the Wall Street forecast, and the S&P futures dropped 20 points on a dime, and they were down about 19 when London closed for the weekend. When I woke up this morning, futures were still down about 14, and as soon as the stock market opened up, they shot straight up like a rocket. And right now, the futures are up 16. They've been up as high as uh, 17. So essentially, you've had a 1.5% turnaround from Friday until today on no news other than some more lame economic data that was released today. And it, it, it's a colleague of mine texted me, you know, this, you know, this market's a nightmare. And I texted back, it's, it's not a nightmare. It's just plain silly. It's stupid silly. <laughs> yes, it is stupid silly. And what was what I thought was interesting about the employment report is the 126,000 number was based on the establishment survey is the survey which gives us the headline number of 126,000 and the household survey is used to calculate the unemployment rate. Now the interesting thing about this whole thing is that the establishment survey shows us breaks it down employment by age buckets and the only bucket that showed job gains was the 55 and over age category, which supposedly people in that age bucket found 329,000 jobs. So that means that every other category, i.e. between 16 and 55, experienced a loss of 203,000 jobs. That's a lot. It's a, it's a hell of a lot. And... What's even more interesting is that the labor force participation rate hit a thirty hit a thirty seven year low at sixty two point seven. Now thirty seven years ago was nineteen seventy eight, and most most households were one income housing units. In other words, the the uh, the housewife of the household did not work. So for for thirty seven point three percent of the working age population to not be working made sense. And then that the, the labor force participation rate climbed steadily up until, I don't know, I don't have the graph in front of me, early 2000s. And that's probably when our economy really started declining for good. Because what we've had since the Fed started QE has not been econo real economic growth and it hasn't been a recovering economy. It's been a asset bubble fueled money printing frenzy and that's about it so the bottom line here is is that I mean the not only is the the employment report a complete and absolute joke but so is the way that the stock market reacts to it uh, there's a reporter the business reporter for the New York Post a guy named John Crudell and he's about the only one out there who reports truth I, I don't know why his editors let him report the truth, but he wrote an article last week that basically said, best case, the employment report is not usable. The numbers are so unreliable. And the worst case is, is that it's a complete fraud, and he's got some inside contacts who have told him that the Census Bureau, who does 
the data gathering for the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which publishes the report, um, an insider had told him that the, you know, the Census Bureau fudges a lot of their data gathering. So these numbers are a joke. Yeah, they're completely meaningless, and they have been for some time. I mean, John Williams proves that over and over, month after month. I mean, it's like the uh, inflationary numbers. I mean, they're the the rate of inflation being somewhere around two percent, according to the Fed, is a is a joke. I mean, that's it's not what I'm experiencing. That's not what you're experiencing. That's not what anybody's experiencing. So, and uh, I. It's gotten to the point to where I, I almost don't even pay any attention to them because it, it, it's a waste of it's a waste of my time. To be perfectly honest, I mean it's all a lie and it's all propaganda, and the only thing that it does is trigger the algorithms in the computers that make the S and P uh, respond and react the way that it does. And once again, that's another rigged market. It's been proven. It's not a theory. It's a fact. It's it's completely rigged, and it's I, I'm not I'm not vested in it. I, I know that you are. I know that it has a, has a direct impact on you. It has no impact on me at all because I don't have anything in it, and so it's it can do whatever it wants to do. Because I, I I don't I just don't I don't pay any attention to it anymore. It's like watching the um, gold and silver ticker at Kitco. It has, it's not based in reality. It has nothing to do with reality. I cannot get gold and silver at those prices. I cannot get, I can't get even close to them. I mean, the best deal out there right now is over at uh, SD Bullion. They've got Silver Eagles at 225 over spot. But other than that, I mean, that's as close as you're going to get. Uh, it is what it is. There are, it's all lies and propaganda in order to keep the just to keep the masses pacified, and that's it. Well, the the one interesting piece of data that I did manage to find over the weekend, and and this is something that that should cause a lot of fear among anyone who's invested in the general stock market, and that is according to Investor Intelligence, which puts out a survey on the percent of market participants who are bullish versus bearish and it's it's over the years it's been a phenomenal contrarian indicator and right now the percentage of market participants who are bearish are at an all-time low for the history of the series which goes back to about 1990 Jeez. and so if if the contrarian indicator works this time around it means the next sell off is going to be a doozy well we've been we've been expecting that for some time now right i mean as far as the sell off it's eventually going to happen because yeah. eventually all the money printing and and all of the manipulation is going to fail and when it fails it's going to fail colossally yeah because the and the, the housing market and i know you follow that very closely it, it's going belly up at this point, and that's really one of the main driving forces of our economy. Isn't that right? Yes. And in fact, um, San Francisco led the last, to, the, when the bu housing bubble popped, San Francisco's real estate market turned first. Well, the Case Shiller report shows that prices are declining, and there's a, there's a data service that tracks sales volume by city and San Francisco, the city, their their sales volume for February was down something like 30% year over year. I'm going to write about it later this week. Wow. wow. That's and, I, significant. I, and I just saw another chart and also high-end New York real estate, New York City real estate is also a bellwether indicator. And the number of high-end new construction listings is up 100% year over year in New York City. So, I mean, the supply is starting to really come on stream, especially at the high end, which I've been writing about in, in the Denver area for quite some time. The, the, the high end listings, are there's just been an avalanche of them all around the Denver metro area. That doesn't sound very good. No. And we have... Uh, 
we're getting ready to bring on the line uh, the silver guru, Mr. David Morgan, from the Morgan Report. I guess we should just go ahead and bring him on. What do you think, Dave? I think that's a great idea because I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. I've been looking forward to this. I, I know you and I are on um, a couple of, of the same email chains, but uh, I, I've been reading your work. I've been doing this sector since probably mid-2001, and I've probably been reading you know your work on and off since at least 03 or 04. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Well, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. David Morgan, the silver guru himself, and he is the author of The Morgan Report. That's a, that's a monthly uh, subscription-based report, and he is the co-author of the just-released The Silver Manifesto. How are you today, David? Quite well, thank you, Roy. Well, we're certainly glad that you're here, and, and it's a great time to have you on with with everything that's going on in the market or not going on in the market, as the case may be. And I want to throw it over to, uh, to Dave. What, uh, what's going on in the silver market right now? And, and, you know, what do you think about it? Well, right now, first of all, what I think about it is we're very undervalued. Uh, I think I can make that statement with, and with a lot of fact, not just emotion and, being an extreme silver bull. That's number one. And what's going on has been going on for a long time. And I really don't like playing the manipulation card because uh, although it exists and we took a whole chapter in our book to explain it in a way that I think is um, irrefutable, but nonetheless, uh, it does exist. It's been going on for quite some time. And yet it weakens, I think, some people's attitude toward purchasing metals because the idea is that, well, if they can manipulate it today, they can manipulate it tomorrow, they can manipulate it forever, and therefore, why get involved in the market? And the answer to that question is that no manipulation has ever gone on forever. Uh, the best example in recent times, and it's not, you know, recent, recent, like, you know, within the last few years, but it's certainly in my lifetime, is the gold pool in London. And that was an extreme example of a manipulation gone bad. So if you really want to get some conviction about uh, the most powerful on the planet, so to speak, having the inability to control a market over a substantial amount of time, look at what happened in the London Gold Pool. So that is the basis moving on. There's, there's so many essential reasons to own precious metals, and I don't think we'll take the time to go into that. So... Where are we now? We're in a, I think, a breakout phase, meaning this will take, I think, quite some time from here. My projection at this point in time, Dave, is for us to see a sideways to maybe uptrending market for months, meaning from like April, May, June, July, August. I think in September, we might hit a low and then start up. Or we could just start up in September. Uh, don't know. I think September is going to be pivotal for a lot of reasons. But that remains to be determined. Having said all of that, let me just reach out to everybody and state that we will be doing an interview uh, for the May issue of the Morgan Report. And in this issue, it will be with somebody that's been very accurate in their calls on the silver market using Elliott Wave, and it's not Prechter, it's someone else, that I met at the PDAC, and we had a nice chat before uh, he spoke. He spoke from the platform just before I spoke. So it was just one of those called coincidences where I got to listen to his entire presentation, and I was very impressed with his work and what he said and what his projections were for the gold market and the silver market were very, very uh, robust. Uh, basically, what he said was, imagine, close your eyes and imagine the first 10 years of the market. Now, close your eyes and imagine the next 10 years. In the next 10 years, I see gold going up tenfold. So, let's think about that. 1,200 to 12,000, that's a pretty nice move for a decade. So, he went through everything and he made uh, a couple of references that I had a bit of an issue with. Uh, and one was based not on my work. He wasn't attacking me in any way, shape, or form, but it was a 
made it crystal clear what he had said. In other words, I knew what he meant, but the way he said it wasn't quite what he meant, if that makes any sense. I'm probably off on a tangent here. But we basically agreed at the top. You know, we both called the top. And uh, I think that was important for people in the audience because there were a lot of people there waiting to hear me speak. I was the next one up. So I made that very clear because I thought it was just important for him and for me to clarify that before it was my turn to speak. So I got up, spoke, and I thought, you know, I really need to get you know, someone else, and I do this, you know, not often, but maybe once or twice a year, I interview somebody that's in the space that's well known, has a good track record, et cetera. So we're going to have him uh, participate as, as an interviewee on, in the Morgan Report. He's looking for a new low. I think the low was achieved in November 2014. But again, uh, none of us are always right. Even this guy, his track record is good. I'd say mine is good. Is it perfect? No, no one is. No one. Uh, I mean, you go back, and I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but Jim Sinclair, Mr. Gold, and I know Jim not real well. I've had uh, dinner with him one time. A great guy in many respects. But uh, if you go back and look at some of the predictions he made, in fact, he even had, I think, a million-dollar bet, which actually didn't come to fruition uh, as far as um, – you know, what the price of gold will be at a, by a certain time. So anyway, all that aside, the important points to remember are this. One, no one calls the market accurately every time. Two, we're in a major bull market, and now is the time to buy, even though there's little buying. It's proof. People don't buy bottoms, and it's extremely low when measured in constant dollar terms. And three, it will be the place to be when this market deteriorates further. So very long answer, but thank you. Let me, uh, I just want to circle back. Um, I had a couple questions that sort of I thought about um, while you were speaking. Um, where do you, when I first started in this whole sector, silver was right around four bucks an ounce. Okay. And so right now we're a little bit over 17 bucks an ounce. In terms of relative undervaluation, how do you think the price of silver is now versus when it was $4 an ounce? Because I personally believe that the price of silver now is even more undervalued for a whole host of fundamental reasons um, than it was back in 2000, 2001. Well, that's a, an excellent question. In fact, it's almost the identical question that I posed to myself. Oh, about a month ago or maybe two months ago. And so that's the basis. Uh, and there's a lot more in the last issue of the Morgan Report, which just came out. I mean, we're on the 6th of April as we're doing this, and I published on the 1st of April. In fact, today's actually the publication date. I published the first Monday of every month, which is right now. But So I asked that question, Dave, and uh, not to give the report away for free, but I do a lot for Internet, and I do a lot because I've got a good heart, and I want uh, primarily for people to wake up to the story. I mean, sure, I love them to subscribe, but that's not my primary purpose. I've got to make a living, but uh, I want people to understand what's going on in global picture. So with that preface, I looked at the true mining supply and the price of silver, $4 back when you said to today's 17 and guess what? They're almost identical. So now we can get into the nitpicking, you know, situation and some will because you know some don't have the economics background i do which doesn't make me superior or inferior to anybody it's just what i have studied most of my life and i have a degree <clears throat> that doesn't mean crap believe me because my degree <laughs> my degree is all about the keynesian model but i had already self-studied uh the austrian school for quite some time before i went back to school to get my master's in business and so uh, I'm an adherent to the Austrian school. And using the Austrian school method, we use what's called true money supply. And you can, and that's explained in the Morgan Report. I'm not going to take the time to, to define it. But basically, it's basically cash and circulation and a few other things. And if you do that math, you'll find that roughly $4 silver back when is 17 today. So it's not more undervalued, as you suggested. But it's equally as undervalued. Now, let's take that one step further because this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say during this interview. And most people don't know it still. And that is that $4 silver back in the early 2000s was the lowest inflation-adjusted price of silver in all of recorded history. Now, think about that. 
think about what I just said. Silver has been money on and off for what, 4,000 years? And we had an opportunity in the early 2000s to buy silver at the lowest price on an inflation-adjusted basis in all of recorded history. Am I making any sense yet? Wow. And yet, who was buying at that time? Me and a few others. Me. Not millionaires. I was. <laughs> you were. Dave was. Warren Buffett was buying. Billionaire. George Soros, who I'm not very fond of, I'll put that on the record publicly, was buying. Bill Gates was buying. Jim All Rogers. the billionaires were buying at that level, the lowest inflation adjusted price. Now, let's forward to what I just said. On an inflation adjusted basis, silver today at around the $17 level, it's more like 16 if you want to nitpick, is equivalent to that four-ish dollar level, because I did it on an, uh, an average price for the year. I mean, you can't pick a day. I mean, you could, but I don't want to like, oh, it's this day and that day. So I did it on an average. And we're basically at the same level. So what I'm saying for everybody, and I want to make it crystal clear, is if you are willing to buy silver today at around the $16 level in U.S. dollar terms, not in Australian dollars, Canadian dollars, or euros, because gold and silver are up in those currencies, you are buying basically at the $5 level or par, you know, sub $5 level way back 15 years ago. Now, 15 years have gone by. We've had a great deal of monetary inflation in 15 years. So that's where we're at, gentlemen. And what? I'm glad I asked the question. And I'm glad you asked me on the show because this is something that may, I hope, give confidence to those that are out there that are on the fence and say, oh, I need to wait for it to go lower. If you can get it lower, it will be at a new low on an inflation-adjusted price, and I hope you're right. So let me give you a little bit more of my insights, and it's published for free for everybody. I've done this for years. Get on our website, go to silverinvestor.com or silver-investor.com, and sign up for our free email list. And over the next few weeks, for about every three days, you'll get the 10 rules of silver investing that I wrote with my heart and soul so many years ago as a benefit to anybody would-be newbie seasoned investor or anything in between. I wrote it for the Warren Buffetts, the college kid that's buying his first you know, 10th ounce coin and everyone in between on how to invest in this market, not get burned, what to do, how to get a good dealer, and on and on. And those are the 10 rules of silver investing. And get it for free, and especially for people that are out there for the first time because this will benefit you as far as uh, not getting burned, which does happen occasionally in, the, in any investment uh, Field, but it does happen in the metals markets. And if I could just digress a moment, because I've been there, but it was years ago. But whenever someone buys silver or gold or both for the first time, they will mail their check or do their wire or whatever they do, and they'll make their payment. And a day becomes a week, an hour becomes a day, and a day becomes a week, and a week becomes a month. I mean, once you sent your cash off, until that silver returns to your mailbox, people <laughs> all of a sudden have a time warp. <laughs> and the time warp is just, it's funny to me, but not to them. Because they think that, you know, well, four hours have gone by. Why hasn't the mail lady dropped, you know, my coins off, right? And until you get your coins and then you've established a good, you know, a relationship with a certain dealer. And, you know, a lot of people don't know this about the industry. I do is once you, the new investor, have established a relationship with a dealer and you get your coins that you paid for, most people won't change dealers because even though they might not be the lowest priced, and I don't advocate finding the lowest priced dealer, by the way, and I explained that in the 10 Rules of Silver Investing and why. But once they've established a deal, they usually are very loyal to that dealer because why go outside the box? You've, you've got something, you can trust them, you know, you send in your check and, you know, eight days later it shows up in your mailbox as an example and on it goes. So most people don't know that. A lot of the better dealers do know that. And they will, of course, do their best to continue to keep a loyalty basis to whomever buys from them. Myself, personally, of course, I spread it around. Why? Well, I know many of these guys and gals on a first name basis, right? And so 
you know, rather than just buy from one exclusive uh, entity, I spread it around for a lot of different reasons. But uh, anyway, enough said on that, but don't be afraid. Buy when no one else wants to buy. Uh, think like a billionaire. We're at a very big low. Most people don't understand it or know why. We do now. This show is going to be beneficial, hopefully, to those out there in the community that are thinking about buying or adding on the way down. And as I said, if it goes lower, then that's that's a gift. You're buying at a new low. Yeah, I, I agree with that, David. And and you, I wanted to circle back. You had mentioned that you thought that silver had hit a bottom in November. And I, I kind of agree with that. In fact, I'm on record saying I think that Silver will be the best performing asset class of 2015. But here's a little interesting tidbit that I think most people listening to this <clears throat> would be surprised to hear. If you want to, if you want to measure silver from its November 5th low to today, is up 11.8 percent. And that's compared to if you look at the S and P hit a it's it's most recent low was October 15th. So October 15th through today, the S&P is up 11.1%. So just on that basis alone, and obviously it's only early April, but right now silver's kind of leading the pack in terms of uh, rate of return, at least from its bottom. I, I haven't done the year-to-date calculation, but I just wanted to look at it from the low in November because you had used that as a reference point, and I kind of agree with you. Um, I think another interesting lever to maybe talk about here is is you had mentioned that the speaker at PDAC had said he sees gold going up tenfold over the next 10 years, and, and I agree with that, and I think it's going to happen sooner, and I think there's fundamental reasons that you can use to justify a call like that. But um, – if gold goes up 10 times, then we it obviously brings the conversation around to the gold-silver ratio, which currently right now, I haven't calculated it recently. I assume it's in the 60s. I think it's closer to 70. I don't have the exact number myself. But right. right. And, yep. you know, if you want to go back and use the thousands of years time frame, and a lot of people don't know this or aren't aware of it, but in Roman times, the gold-silver ratio was locked in at 8. And historically, since that time, since the fall of the Roman Empire, over over many, many cycles, the gold and silver ratio always seems to touch down around 15. So, you know, where, where do you think we're going to see something like that again, David? Yes, I do. I do. I've been on record for from day one, pretty much, that I thought silver would outperform gold. And I thought ultimately at the top of the market, it would probably have what's I call the monetary ratio is about 15, 16 to 1. And then the natural ratio is about 9 to 1. That's how it's displaced in the earth currently. It used to be 12 to 1, but silver is dispersed um, near the top of, the, of their surface in most cases, not all cases. Anyway, regardless of that, a lot of silver has been mined out. So the ratio, natural ratio is 9 to 1. And I said it in uh, an extreme panic buying, you know, monetary currency crisis, which I do see. It could get down to 10 to 1. But that's just my guesses. I mean, it doesn't mean I'm right or wrong. What I want to think, what I think is the more important point is that it will outperform gold. So if gold goes up 10 times in a decade, it's not unlikely for silver to go up 20 times. But I want to be very clear about this. Silver accelerates at the end. If you want to get a feel for what I expect uh, in this market this time, Look back to the last market where silver made 90% of its move in the last 10% of the time. And I go through this in the book. And that is not necessarily that it's going to repeat that. I'm not saying that I guarantee you or anything like that, that you'll see 10, you know, 90% of the move in 10% of the time. What I do want to make clear is that all markets accelerate near their end. You can go back to the tech wreck and see that. You can see the housing bubble and see that. It's like, oh my, you know, oh my goodness, housing prices are so high. But then the what I call lemmings come in near the top. It's like everybody's buying real estate. I better buy it. But they're late to the party, but they don't know it yet. And it gets that final push higher in a very, very short amount of time. And then there's nobody to buy. And that's that I think will happen again in the uh, in the metals markets. The deal with silver is that it's such a small market, much smaller than gold, and it's much more affordable than gold. 
So what you'll see this time, I believe, is an acceleration in the silver market. That means silver will outperform gold. And also for those that are out on the mining side of things, if we get into a squeeze, and I think we will, meaning that it'll be difficult to get physical silver and gold in size, that a lot of people will move to the equities because one, uh, they're easier to buy. Most people have some kind of electronic trading account. You know, the postman on the block has one. I mean, almost everybody these days, you might not have much in it, uh, but they have one. And so it's much easier to go on one of these uh, electronic accounts and press a mouse that says XYZ gold mining or ABC silver mining than it is to go down to the dealer <laughs> or go to the house. So they'll do that. So I this agree. will take this will take the equities to an extreme. And at the top of the market last time, so facts are on my side here, a very good gold company sold for about 30 times earnings, but a very good silver company sold at 50 times earnings, which I'll circle right back to the question. Why is that? Well, it's like, why is Pepsi inferior to uh, Coca-Cola? They're both colored sugar water for crying out loud. They're basically the same product. I'm not saying silver and gold are that identical. They're not. But one's favored over the other. Why? Because the market says so. That's why. So the market last time favored a silver company 50 times earnings and a gold only at 30 times earnings, which is an outperformance of a silver company. Not double, but almost. So that'll give you a flavor for what I'm stating. And I totally believe that's what you'll see again. And with the, uh, I want to stay with the mining for just a minute. And with the price of silver currently below the cost of mining for the primary silver miners, and if copper goes much lower, it's going to begin having an effect on the base metal miners. And, and both of them are going to start shutting down if they're not, you know, slowing down, slowing down their operations currently in where, where's the silver coming from, David? I mean, it's, which is a question I've been asking for a very long time. Well, first, I want to massage a little bit of what you said, Roy. And what you said was, past tense, extremely accurate going back, I don't know, a few months ago, maybe six. But we've had this huge uh, drop in the oil price. And that's a huge cost to miners. I mean, mining is extremely energy intensive. Yeah, so sure. as a quick example, if you go to First Majestic, which is on our list and I own it. So let me get that out there for the public domain. Uh, they're all in cost. Well, they're around $21, $22 per ounce, all in sustaining cost for First Majestics. We just did it, I think, three or four weeks ago. And now it's fourteen fifty. They didn't squeeze that much margin out of their operations, although they did some. I mean, some credit goes to the company itself for looking at how they can squeeze their margins. In other words, how they can mine more efficiently. But most of it went because of the drop in oil prices. So right now, there is not the danger that there was six months ago, Roy, as far as mines shutting down due to um, the cost of mining because they have been helped a great deal. For how long? I don't know. I mean, exactly. you know, well, I think a year. I think this oil price thing could last a year, but, you know, that's a guess. I'm not that great an oil analyst, although I look at it, you know, harder than most average Americans. I have to. It's part of the mining uh, situation. So back on track, yes, uh, there could be some curtailment. Uh, you know, one that we're doing an update report on is zinc. It's really one of the most unsexy metals out there, but we're going to get close to a zinc shortage here pretty quick. And we, you know, one of the reasons you get a report like the Morgan Report is the world's dynamic. It changes. I mean, the price in these commodities change every day. Uh, perception changes very often. And the other thing is like the zinc study that we did, oh, I'm going to guess a year ago, which I think we were the first to do it. We even led some of the bank analysts. Uh, nonetheless, the situation is better for zinc now than it was uh, <clears throat> than it was at the time of that first report. So uh, again, it's not, you know, the, it's not silver, it's not gold, it's not sexy, but it is a needed metal. In fact, what's interesting about zinc is that zinc doesn't have the, as many uses as silver does, but it's probably second place. There's a lot of uses for the zinc uh, metal. Anyway, back on track, 
I think that the mining sector is more undervalued than the metal sector itself, but I want to be consistent because people ask, you know, well, I'm just getting started. What should I do? You should always buy the real metal first. And I'm not a coin dealer, but that's where you really should start. Yeah, I'm not a coin dealer either, and I couldn't agree with you more. Get it, get something that's physical in your hand and that you can hold on to. And I wanted to uh, read something from your book, and this is from Chapter 5. It's from the uh, Silver Manifesto. And then I want you to, I'd like for you to comment on it, David. And this is from page 103, and it says, The current inflationary structure of the Federal Reserve and its member banks dictates three primary phases of inflation. In this case, we will start with society having deflationary expectations, such as was the case after the 2008 crisis. Note that many think that inflation's only ill effect is causing prices to rise, but just as importantly is perhaps much more sinister in that it causes a redistribution of wealth. Those who get the newly created money first benefit, but at the cost of those who receive it last. It is the banking system, select corporate entities, and the political elites who receive the money first. If you would, I'm going to stop right there. If you would, David, just explain that out just kind of for everyone to understand because I, like you, like to keep it simple and let's talk to the people that are new to this sector. I think the most important thing is, you know, something I was taught as a kid and it's, I believe it, uh, but it's belief can't be proven yet. And that is that you can't live a lie forever. Having that basis, the whole system is based on a lie because the lie is you can get something for nothing. The adage that there is no such thing as a free lunch, I believe is true. There's a price to pay for everything. And the price that society has paid for this ability of a few banking elite to create quote unquote money, it's really currency, out of absolutely nothing is going to have a day of reckoning. So what I said in the statement you read was that the banking elite and their cohorts get to produce what's considered to be money by the populace at no cost to them and benefit because they get it first to, to use it, say fiction really, a legal fiction, to use it to buy wealth. In other words, to buy real estate or buy a yacht or buy another home or create a business or loan it to basically the public at large. And the public at large could consist of legal fictions like corporations, individuals, car dealerships, real estate ventures, etc. So they have the ability to create something for nothing and foist it on the people. And this game has been tried time and time and time again. The idea that history repeats is accurate, and yet the greatest lesson of history is that people don't learn the lessons of history. But every time this has been foisted on the people, at some point it backfires, or the truth comes out. The lie cannot be lived forever. The problem is, and I, you can check my work for free, the stuff I've done for free for years, which has been a pretty substantial body of work, and I think Dave will attest to that if he's followed me as long as he says, as I said, what worried me the most, and this was in the year 2000, early 2000s, 2002 or three, I believe, is that not is it only the Roman Empire this time, but it is a global empire this time. So as the dollar goes, so goes the world. Now, I must interject, as I said a moment ago, the world's dynamic and things change. And it's obvious that the BRICS nations, at least at the surface level, are looking to escape the dollar demise by starting this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, by the BRICS starting their own uh, settlement system, a uh, competitor to the SWIFT system. And so there may be, and I say may, be the possibility that these nations may be able to escape the demise of the dollar, but I doubt it. Even if they have these entities up and working and they're really building infrastructure that's needed and basically benefiting uh, members of their consortium, 
by actually helping the people with building infrastructure, et cetera, needed things. Uh, it may not, it may be, a, you know, too little, too late, my view. But, you know, again, the market's no more than any of us. But that's the idea, that we have given the power, we've given our power to the banking elite to basically make them our rulers and us their subjects. Which is exactly backwards. Exactly backwards. No, the idea at the foundation of the country was that our rights were not given by man, but they were God-given, constitutionally secured rights. And we, the people, held all the rights given by God, and that only a small portion of those rights would be handed over to the government to protect. And the idea of letting the, them have some rights was the idea that they could, we, the people, could band together for our own protection. So if something happened and someone attacked us, as an example, we'd be able to band together in a formal way, or informal, but informal really, and be able to protect ourselves. But the idea was that the government was there to secure those rights, and that's what the Constitution is. So re listen to what I say again. It was set up so that your God-given, constitutionally secured rights. The Constitution was there to secure those rights. The government was there to protect those rights. Remember, when you said you want to get simple, let's get really simple. Let me say three things. Please. Number one, I am the most politically correct person on the planet. I'll prove it. I want only one thing from anybody in office, and I don't care if they're libertarian, Democrat, Republican, demo rep pub, I don't care what the heck they call themselves. I want them to do one thing, uphold the oath of office, which is to uphold the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That's step one. So that's my political position. Number two is what is the basic foundation of the law, the God-given law, the natural rights of man is one, do everything you say you are going to do. That is the basis of all natural or contract law, okay? So when I say, Rory, I'm going to send you this many coins for this fiat, that's a contract. So I have to do everything I say that I'm going to do, and you as well, yes. or otherwise there's a breach of contract. The other one is to not infringe upon the rights of anyone else. What a simple idea. And that's where property rights come in, and that's mostly about criminal law because normally what's uh happens in the cases where that law that natural law is violated is it's my right to own this whatever and someone steals it well that's a crime so that's where criminal law comes in those come from rick mayberry a good friend of mine i interviewed rick on the mastermind series for the morgan report and probably time to have him back but that is the basis for all religion uh, it's the basis for the common law, the natural law, the natural rights of men. And really, it could, could be, can it be that simple in today's world? I don't know. But certainly, those ideals are that simple. But yet, you know how convoluted things have become. So I just wanted to get that out there because, as you said, Roy, let's keep it very simple. Yes. You know, it was at one time pretty darn simple. I mean, the only thing you had, the only exchange you had with the federal government at one time was like a marriage license and a driver's license. That was it. And, uh, you know, now it's like, you know, you got to get a license to go to the bathroom. You got to get a, you know, I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, it's like crazy. It's, it it's it is to the point of the absurd. And I really like what you said, David, because what, it, what your number two rule boils down to a handshake. And if you can't look a, another person in the eye and shake their hand, and the contract is sealed, then you really don't have anything. And that's when, and from, from my, for me and from my life, that's where society starts breaking down. When I can't take you at your word and shake your hand man to man and things happen exactly the way that we agreed, then something has gone very, very wrong. I just had one more quick question. And, and okay, you go ahead. You can defer okay. the answer to your to your website if you want to. Not a problem. I was just you already mentioned first majestic, so I assume you like that mining stock. Could you maybe throw out one of your your favorite junior mining stocks for for listeners? And if you want to just defer them to your website, I completely understand. Sure, I'll tell you what we'll do uh, for the listeners of this program. 
if you go to the website and send an email to our support, support at silver-investor.com, and ask for the zinc report, and this is going to be available in about a month, we'll give you that paid portion of the Morgan report for free. And in that report, there's a company that has been on the Morgan report list for quite some time. So this does a little bit of benefit to me because one, there's a misperception out there that all we talk about is the silver market or the silver and gold market, which we focus most of our attention on. That's a fact. But we also look at the resource sector in total. We've looked at moly, we've looked at lithium, we've looked at copper, we've looked at zinc, we've looked at copper, we've looked at uh, potash, uh, we've looked at almost everything out there. And that's something that most people don't know about the market report. So this will be an opportunity. So listeners, I'll say it again, send an email to support at silver-investor.com and put in the subject line, say zinc report. You're going to have to be patient. It's early April, and in early May, the report will be ready. But that will be about half of the Morgan Report. For everybody listening to this program, if you send us an email, we will send you that for free. And included in that report, we will let you know which junior mining company we like so well uh, in the zinc space. That's awesome, David. Thank you very much. That's that's just icing on the cake for this for this. Uh, podcast uh, because it's uh mr cranzler i would have to say this is one of the better ones what do you think yeah i agree and david we really appreciate your time and this this has been an awesome podcast i look forward to re-listening to it all right well thank you gentlemen i appreciate uh you allowing me your time and me giving yours i think uh, i think that it was well done uh, also not to pat myself on the back in any way shape or form but um I think the right questions, you know, a lot of the interviews, oh, that was a good one. Well, it has a lot to do with the, the questions, you know. So thank you for asking some great questions. Well, thank you very much. You bet. All right, David. We'll talk to you soon. Very good. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, David.